So I'm Frances Morris and I'm the director of Tate Modern in London. I was educated in London at a, a, a state school, so not a private school. Um, I was always very interested in politics and culture. Both my parents were, um, my father was an architect, my mother was an artist. And although I thought about maybe becoming an artist, I realized in my teenage years that actually I was more interested in thinking about the world through art and writing about art and the history of art than I was in actually making art. So I went from school to university. I went to Cambridge University. Um, I studied history and art history. And I then uh, was blessed by uh, leaving university at a time when nobody wanted to be a museum curator. It wasn't difficult. The history of my time at Tate has been, a, uh, I began at a time when we were almost 100% funded by the state. National Museum to a point now where we're about 35% funded by the state. So in that intervening period, we've built this huge ecology of private funding, both kind of corporate funding, major capital donations, but the bread and butter is continuous fundraising with a very big community, most of collectors who support us collecting. So that's been an incredible shift in the ecology of museums over the last 20 years. It's, it has possibly created the most problematic and toxic area of conflicts of interest where the public values of the museum come up like that against the individual, personal and you know, corporate interests of, 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 of patrons and um, giving uh, corporate organisations. But that's both a kind of concern but it's also a very powerful driver of commitment and it, what we've I think done is built a tried to build and maintain a kind of metaphorical iron wall between the decision making that happens in the museum and the kind of autonomy of the museum and its values and its vision and its mission and then on the other side this wonderful and I mean wonderful support community of individuals so who support us and get lots of access to us but what we cannot let happen is we cannot let that private community have access to decision making and I do think it's possible to be a very a publicly facing publicly indebted kind of publicly owned museum and yet have a very significant degree of private funding that in it, sustainability lies in that direction Oh, we think about new models of fundraising. Well, I think um, we never stop thinking about new models of everything. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about the 21st Century Museum is it's, uh, it reinvents itself in a kind of you know, ongoing way. So we're very responsive. So where we see new opportunities for fundraising, we will follow them. Well, I think, I think there are areas, and we live in a moment where new museums are evolving daily across the world. New museums in places without histories, without collections, without necessarily deep knowledge. Um, we have knowledge, we have history, we, have, we can partner. And it, what's interesting, if you look at the way we've been delivering programs, projects, even collections over the last decade or so, almost nothing now comes without a sense of partnership. So that, how you develop the partnership model with institutions and individuals is something I'm very interested in. A move from the old-fashioned give and take. What, do, what does partnership look like uh, over the longer term? Value is an interesting subject. I think there, um, there's, there's cultural value or artistic value and then there's financial value. And in the museum context, we're only interested in cultural and artistic value. Um, it is a fact that when we acquire things for the collection, sometimes it will have an impact on the marketplace outside the museum. And then it may be difficult for us to acquire other works. But that is something that's very difficult to control. But once in the museum collection, it's there in perpetuity. We don't ever sell work from the collection. So even if it, if it increases in value, it's immaterial from our point of view. Um, most, almost all the exhibitions that you see at Tate Modern have been originated either by Tate Modern or in collaboration with another organization. So we will often partner 
with a museum in America or Europe uh, or South America to conceive an exhibition together so that it's very much jointly conceived. So what happens in that instance is that you will see it in, uh, for example, Guggenheim, and it'll have a, ve a very much a, a feel and a kind of complementarity with the space there. When it arrives in London, our curatorial team reshape it for our spaces. So what, what, what that partnership allows us to do is uh, bring expertise together, so you know, double the expertise, but also double our financial resources so we can make much more powerful shows when we do them in, in combination with other organizations. I mean, the big challenge at the moment and looking forward is actually how we partner, as we really do want to do, with organizations in countries which are either in conflict or uncertain times and where lenders are reluctant to lend. You know, we would love to work with the Sorsuk Museum, for example, in Beirut. And uh, over the next few years, we're really going to be trying to find a way to work with organizations that we haven't worked with before. And we've had fantastic collaborations this year, for example, with MASPI in Sao Paulo with Adriana Pedrosa, which has just been incredibly exciting. So that's a new partnership. So together, we, we can be more powerful than, ca than we can be separately. Most of, most of the exhibitions are par partnerships. So we share costs, um, we work together on loans, a curator from our organization works with a curator from their organization, and of course then the, all the investment in an exhibition can be stretched over six months rather than three months, or a year if you have four partners. So like Soul of a Nation, the show we did last summer, which was a huge amount of research, three months in London, but now it's... Uh, be at Crystal Bridges in America, it would be in Brooklyn and then Los Angeles. I don't think we're interested in the colonial model. I mean, we come from a, a, a colonial power. Uh, our colonial power was long in the past. I think we're much more interested in, in, in culture, cultural conversations and conversations that take place in different centers across the world. We're really excited about the way Tate can animate a kind of network of organizations rather than being a a kind of dominating authorial voice. I deliver, I oversee and manage the decision-making process around all the creative content that takes take, take place at Tate Modern. So from major exhibitions through to live events and collection displays. So that's my, it's incredibly important to me to have an overview of everything that we produce in terms of artistic content because I'm very, I believe very strongly that we need to have strong alignment within the creative team so that what we do with the collection is in dialogue with what we do with exhibitions and the exhibitions support our live program. So it's, it's a, it's, I kind of, I think of myself as, an or, uh, as a conductor of a fantastic orchestra where every single member is a kind of genius. But a geniuses can go off in their different directions. So. All the time I have to bring the geniuses back together and say, play together, sing together, and so I make it work as a whole. Of course, when we're working with works made by artists where the artist is no longer with us, um, if the work has been acquired during the lifetime of the artist, you, we have an amazing opportunity to talk to the artist about how they would like the work to be displayed after their death. So we're able to have those very those difficult conversations what happens when the technology disappears? What happens if we run out of something? In the case of Oita Sika, um, we followed the installation according to his wishes and according to the wishes of his estate, but and with the inclusion of a live parrot. Now, in the context of London, that created a, a really, really powerful and horrible public response because there's a very, very strong advocacy in the UK against using animals in live display. And after we had received, I mean, thousands of complaints and demonstrations in the gallery of, and letters from people who were incredibly upset about seeing the live animals, we took the, I took the decision that we would have to find another way of representing the live parrots in the display. And I, I deeply regret the 
um, the fact that there were complaints and the fact that many, many people were upset, but I also feel very troubled by the, the decision I took. I think it was the right decision, but I think probably we should have installed the work in a slightly different way. We should have given it a bigger space, we should have had it separate from other displays, we should have had notification that we were going to do it, we should have just presented it with a little bit more care and attention. But of course what, what is interesting is it's indicative that we live at a moment in time where people, especially younger people, are much more prepared to say when they don't like something. You know, people will, will speak out, they will demonstrate. And uh, I ha in a way, I have to think that's a good thing. What, what's going on with censorship? I mean, I, again, as, a, as a, um, a director and a curator, I feel incredibly strongly that the art museum is a space where we show artists without censorship. And that it's a platform for artists to air their views. At the, at the same time, we have a public responsibility to do that in a way where we make the platform visible. It's not, we mustn't say this is our view, we make the platform, we, we host debate, we encourage debate, we encourage reflection, we provide a lens, but we're not saying this is this or that is that. That was the mistake that we made with Oita we didn't, we didn't make it clear to the public that what it was that they were looking at. It wasn't a caged bird in 2000 and 16 it was a work of art and you know we, we've got to work we've got to keep on at that being a um, being a place for radical ideas we, we're a big museum we should be able to support and nurture the difficult discussions well the turbine hall has been an extraordinary feature of Tate Modern since we opened in 2000 um, I mean the, the idea right from the start was the turbine hall did a few things first of all it was an industrial space and we knew that artists wanted to be represented in industrial space. It was also somewhere for us that we felt kind of broke through that idea of the museum being a box of white cubes. So it's a, kind of, it's a space between the white cube and the street, a public space. And as you, as you probably know, the first five or six years, artists who we commissioned to make works in it tended to make very big, spectacular things. You know, it's obvious. It's an obvious response to a big space to make a big thing. But what's been interesting is that over the last 10 years, artists have begun to explore the space in, in different ways, as a, a space of sound, a space of um, a community, a space of performance, a space of intellectual or political engagement. So it's no longer, I think, about the spectacle. It's become much more about how you animate a social space, so it's the way art works in, a, in the context of the, of the public. And, and in light of that, the way the public use the space has become much more well, both democratic, but also there's this sense of ownership that people will come in carrying their banners, making a demonstration, or they'll come in and do yoga. You know, kids will come in and kick a ball around. And interestingly, all that seems to work quite well with respect for works of art. So it's beginning to, I think, really create a set, well, a really genuinely hybrid space so that you see that some of these things that maybe 10 years ago we thought were incompatible actually can work alongside each other. That the museum is capable of being a mul very multifaceted organization for very different constituencies to use, that idea of the, it's a useful space. Entertainment, Enter, so Tate Modern is a social space, so it's a space where people congregate to do things together, including entertain themselves and be entertained. But the key thing is it's, it's a, it's a, it's purposeful entertainment. So I don't think, it's not a cinema space, it's not a theatre space, it's, mu it's a much more engaged space, but that event aspect of it I think is incredibly important. I mean, once described the museum as a, um, a, a coming together of a university and a playground, but equally you could say a university and a nightclub. You know, it is a place where art and life find a way of connecting, and at one end there's deep engagement with art. And you know, we absolutely, if you want a hardcore experience of really difficult art, Tate Modern's a very good place to do it. 
but at the same time it can it can be somewhere where you can completely let your hair down well isn't it interesting that um, 10 years ago we were all talking about museums disappearing in an age of digital culture actually what's happening is that in this virtual world people are really ever more hungry for experiences of real unique things and also experiences when they're together with other people people want to be in rooms with other people looking at unique things people want to be having real conversations in real spaces and people want to have ways of thinking about the world rather than just reading tweets and so the art museum which is full of objects through which to look at the world and full of people to talk to and full of unique experiences suddenly uh, have, have, are more relevant than they've ever been in the history of museums. Okay, so when I, when I became the director of the collection, which was in 2006, I kind of had a 10-year plan about building this more international collection. But as director of Tate Modern, I've had a five-year plan. And that was rather specific because I took on the directorship of Tate Modern at a time when we were just opening a new building. And what I felt therefore was that I had to have a very intense five-year plan really to activate that new building and that I would need five years with the team to, to really work, you know, two years to work out how the building functions, see what works, doesn't work, and another three years to build the program to get to a feeling where we're comfortable and happy with it. And I think that's about right. So we're two years into that five-year program. It's on track. What is interesting is that we're already now thinking about the next five years. So it is a sort of 10-year time frame. It's interesting, the 10-year thing. Um, because, of course, you, you never stop moving into your next five years or your 10 years, because every day is that you're moving into the future. So you revise your ideas, you respond, you ditch things. If they don't work, you don't waste time trying to resurrect them. You adapt and... So I think the vision unfolds. So the five-year vision is now unfolding into a 10-year vision. So it's a matter of will. If institutions like Tate wish to redress the balance, the gender balance, the racial balance, they can. We can take the decision. So we have taken the decision at Tate Modern to make sure that our collection displays are 50-50 in their monographic, in the, in the artists who, you know, the signature artists. And we're really trying to push that agenda through into our exhibition program as well. It's an act of will. Obviously, I'm tr deeply troubled when museum directors, and most recently, this kind of crop of really, really powerful female directors and senior curators have been dismissed. But I think in this case, they're multiple and they're different reasons. Um, and, but directors do carry the can for their organizations, and that's why we have directors. And directors are in that position to support the institution and support their curators. And, they take the rap. I would laugh, in January was on the, um, the board of the AWARE Prize in France, which is a prize that's given annually to the achievements of a female artist. Um, I've been recently on the board to select a prize winner for um, the Bonfantin Museum Biennial Exhibition, uh, this time for a Middle Eastern artist. Um, so I'm you know, regularly called upon to help assess artists' achievements and museum practices. And I, I really enjoy those things because it gives you an opportunity to step outside your institution and your role and, and think in a different way. Yeah. Well, I always think that um, uh, I think the, the way we progress is we, we worry about what we can't do for a little bit and then we decide to do it anyway. So it's a kind of trying to achieve the unachievable so we've been talking recently about practices, artist practices that we haven't conventionally collected because they can't be collected. You know, maybe they're invisible, maybe they're uh, sonic or uh, olfactory, or maybe they're, you know, time-based. And so we're working on a way of making sure we can collect those practices. Uh, we're thinking about exhibitions that we don't think we can do, and then we'll find a way to do them. But the particular sort of, um, I suppose, I, I think what will drive us more than anything over the next five years is moving from a, a museum with walls, we've spent 20 years building walls,
to a museum where the walls don't actually matter any longer. So that's my current thinking. Take the walls away, metaphorically.